Our lecture this morning is going to be about our friend Pablo Picasso. And this is an artist whose name is synonymous with art creation. We know this person automatically without having to take an art class. And we kind of put him up on a pedestal along with artists such as Michelangelo or Van Gogh, who are going to go down in the pantheon of great artists. This is a person who was born at the perfect time and had the perfect talent to become famous. Born in 1881, he basically lived through all the modern art movements and then passing away in 1973, literally during my lifetime. There are people alive today who knew, met, and talked with Picasso. He was born in Spain to a father who was a fairly famous art teacher in fact, the father moved the family to Barcelona shortly after Picasso's birth to take a teaching position there. His mother was a painter. And although Picasso was never considered a child prodigy, he still produced his first painting at the age of eight. Picasso worked in an incredible amount of different mediums including painting, drawing, sculpture, collage, printmaking, costume and set design, newspaper and book illustration, and advertising. There was nothing this guy couldn't do. Maybe unless it was architecture, and thank God he didn't do any architecture. Can you imagine the type of buildings he would have designed? Picasso had an incredibly wide range of artistic style. He could produce something so representational you would swear it was done by a Renaissance master. But he's also the artist that leads us into abstraction. In his 91 years, Picasso allegedly produced over 15,000 works of art. And some people argue he produced as many as 50,000 works. Now, if we take the 15,000 and divide that up by the years he was active, this means he produced 180 works of art every single year, basically one every other day of his life. By the time he's 16, he gets his very first newspaper article published about him. When he was 14, he completed the work at the left, and by 19, he had come had his own first solo exhibition, and most of them were paintings of families and friends, mostly portraits. Now you need to be familiar with the different styles or different periods of Picasso's life. And we're gonna begin with the blue period, which ranges from 1901 to 1904, where we have blue as the dominant color on the palette. During this time, Picasso is living in Spain, and he's not the famous artist we know of him as today. Basically, he is the quintessential starving artist, and he's hanging around with other people who are like him. People who are poor, homeless, beggars, prostitutes, and Picasso deems this group of people as victims of society. Probably the lowest point of the Blue Period was this painting, which is a memorial portrait for one of Picasso's close friends who committed suicide. The gentleman in this painting is Casagamus, and he was in love with the girl next to him, Genevieve, but she leaves him for another man. Casagamus ends up killing himself over the situation. And Picasso was really torn up about this since they had such a close friendship and he only had wished that this guy had reached out to talk to him. In this painting also we have an image off to the right which looks to be like a Madonna and child. During this time Picasso as I had mentioned was very poor and he didn't have any money for a model to pose for him. So what he would do is he would go down to prisons and he would paint the prisoners. This woman is such a prisoner, she had been arrested for prostitution, 
And so we have a really interesting image in this work, kind of a juxtaposition between sinner and saint. But Picasso's career and life does get better. During the Rose period, which lasts from 1904 to 1905, we see the palette that he has lighten up. Picasso is also making the transition to move to Paris full time, and he does so in 1904. He's moving to Paris at the bequest of Gertrude Stein, who becomes his foremost patron. And Gertrude Stein, along with her two brothers, are really the most instrumental patrons of these early modern artworks, buying works from Picasso and Matisse and Cezanne. They were really the first patrons to grab on to how important these artworks were going to be. The painting that you see on the screen is called The Family of Saltenbanks, which are a family of circus performers. Picasso himself is in this painting off to the left, dressed up as a harlequin. And when you see harlequins in his paintings, those are self-portraits of Picasso. The little girl whose hand he's holding is his sister who had passed away at the age of eight. The painting itself is rather large, about seven to eight feet in height and width. And even though these, this family is supposed to be a, a very entertaining family for their business, there's nothing really very entertaining about this painting. And even that figure that is kind of a ghostly figure off to the right that's sitting down, we don't know if this woman is part of this group or is just sitting at the side of the road. We don't even know which direction these figures are traveling. And here are Leo, Gertrude, and Michael Stein. Gertrude Stein, of course, being the famous writer, and then her brothers, Leo and Michael, were all art collectors. Which leads us to the famous portrait of Gertrude Stein by Picasso. This is an artwork that she sat for over 20 times and Picasso just couldn't get the facial features correct. This is painted over the winter of 1905 and 1906, and Picasso went on vacation back to Barcelona for about six weeks. Before he left, he wiped off the canvas where the face was, and when he came back, he painted the face from memory. He gave her the painting, and her comment was, I don't look like this. And he kind of came back with the retort about, don't worry about it, you will. I think it is a very uh, close portrait to her. And here they are on vacation together in France. This is Faith Rheingold's quilt that shows Gertrude Stein's apartment and many famous modernist artworks by both Picasso and Matisse above her. And this is her true apartment. And you can see the wide array of artworks on the wall. And when you think about each of those paintings today is probably worth about $20 million. It's a pretty impressive collection. And now let's move on to Picasso's most famous work, La Demoiselle de Avignon. Done in 1907, this is a painting that really transforms the world of art. The title itself translates to the young ladies of Avignon and young ladies being kind of a euphemism for prostitutes because what we're seeing is the view that we would have entering this brothel. Avignon is a street in Barcelona. It's not the city in France. It's the street in Barcelona where all the brothels are lined up. It's the red light district. And Picasso's work opens the door not only for cubism, which he's noted for, but this is the very first abstract work of art. A definition of abstraction that we looked at earlier on in the semester is a rendering of objects in a stylized or simplified way so that while they remain recognizable, their formal or expressive aspects are emphasized. And that's a pretty dense definition. But basically what it means by rendering the objects in a stylized or simplified way 
is that we're taking these organic forms and making them geometric. We're taking curved line and we're transforming that into straight line. But they're, the key is that they're going to remain recognizable. So we can still identify these figures as women, but their formal or expressive aspects are emphasized. Formal aspects are going to be like line, shape, and color, and definitely expressive aspects deals with color. Picasso tended to mute a lot of his paintings, and we're gonna have other artists, such as Franz Marc, who really intensifies their artwork. Again, we can identify these objects, but they don't appear natural. And what's going to be important for us for this definition later on is abstraction must be derived from something. When we get to the abstract expressionist painters of the 1940s and 50s, their work is not going to be abstract, which is kind of weird to think about right now, but their work is going to have a further classification called non-objective art. But when they first created it, it was so new it didn't have its own name and it got lumped in this group with abstraction. But we're gonna deal with that later. Just know that Picasso's painting is the very first abstract work of art. When we look at it, we're also thinking back to the different roles of the artist back on our first lecture. And one of them was to create beauty. Here though, we don't have that sense of beauty. In fact, we could even say that this painting is pretty ugly. But Picasso does reference the idea of beauty in this work. The women in the center of this painting have their arms back, their elbows pointed up toward the sky. And this is what's called the rising Venus pose. And we see it in artwork from back during the classical age, during the Greek and Roman era, and also during the Renaissance. The figure at the left is wearing an Iberian mask. Those at the right are wearing true African masks. During this time, it was real common for artists and other individuals who lived in France to go across the Mediterranean to vacation in the French colonies in North Africa, such as those seen in Algiers and Morocco. It was also very common for these artists to bring back ideas and even souvenirs of this more primitive lifestyle and add it into their works, making European art very much a hybrid. And Picasso also references the very true representational forms of art by placing a still life at the bottom center of the frame. And when you take an art class in terms of how to create a painting, the very first thing your teacher is going to do is have you paint a still life. It is the first step in learning how to paint. We do have a few preliminary drawings of this work in some of the early drawings we see that there were patrons originally in the painting and then in later copies they were removed and this is before the African masks have been added. And the painting is really large. It's about eight feet square and it is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So Picasso begins this new idea of abstraction and also begins simultaneously this new art movement called Cubism. Cubism emerges not only from Picasso, but also from Georges Braque, who was a Fauvist painter very much in the camp of Matisse. And Fauvism is when you use these very bright, very arbitrary colors in a painting. Brock saw La Demoiselle de Avignon and said something to the effect that seeing this painting was like drinking kerosene and spitting fire. Other artists had kind of the opposite viewpoint of Picasso's work, saying that it was awful. And Matisse even went as far as 
threatening to break off the friendship between the two artists. But Brock definitely joins Picasso, and his most famous work in the Cubist style is Houses at Lestoc. Lestoc is a hillside community in France, and we can see how these houses here have been transitioned into their geometric equivalents. We've got cubes, and their roofs have become pyramids. We can see the transition or transformation in the trees of this work. And as I had just mentioned, Picasso tends to mute his colors. Brock does the exact same thing. These paintings become kind of dull rather than those bright uh, colors that we see in the Fauvist paintings. This is another work by Brock where we start to see the division of the form in the violin down below. And it's really important that the idea of breaking up the different surface qualities of an object that's being painted is something that is seen in cubism. It's kind of like we're almost unwrapping the figure as well. And can you imagine going to Picasso to have your portrait done and having it come out like this? This is Daniel Henry Conviler, who was not only a friend of Picasso, but also one of his early art dealers. And Picasso takes this painting to such an extreme, he's the first artist that starts to write words onto the surface of a canvas, which is really kind of unique and peculiar because we talk about painting and art as a form of communication, and here the communication is so jarbled that we all of a sudden need to have words to let us know what we're looking at. In 1911, when this painting was completed, and it's called Ma Jolie, Ma Jolie was a famous song at the time, but it was also the nickname of Picasso's girlfriend, so he never really let us know what this painting was focused on, although we do have that little musical note just off to the right of the title of the painting. What's exciting about cubism is that this is simultaneously a study in art and in physics because Einstein is working on the theory of relativity, the breaking down of time and space. And that's exactly what cubism is. As we unfold or unwrap these objects that we're painting, we're seeing several of the sides of the object simultaneously. We don't have that time transition where we're moving the object to its different sides. We just see it all at once. And so Picasso and Einstein, they never met, but they were working on the same type of ideas. And that's really kind of an interesting component when we see that blanketed across all the modern art movements. Cubism does have a spinoff called Futurism, and that'll be discussed in an entirely different lecture. But the Futurists are from Italy. They are led by Filippo Marinetti, which you see here standing at the center of this group. And they do get to meet Picasso in 1912. They hang out with him in his studio in France. You can see that a futurist work is very cubist in terms of style with the division of the object and the attention to line, but futurism also contains a sense of dynamism or motion to these artworks. In the 1920s, Picasso is hired by the Russian ballets, the Ballet Russe, to help create the costumes and the set designs for this particular ballet called Parade. And this was a very unique series of ballets uh, set from this group where they would hire modernist artists such as Picasso and Matisse, uh, also the Fauvist artist Durand, but they would also hire very famous musical composers, very modernist composers such as Igor Stravinsky. And then the
and then the choreography would be done by Leonid Massin. So here are some of the costumes that Picasso created for this ballet, and you can imagine for the actor to have to work inside of that, how difficult that would have been to manage. But it definitely looks like a sculptural uh, set of Picasso's paintings. Also at this time, he meets, falls in love with, and gets married to a ballerina named Olga Koklova. They're going to have one son. Uh, unfortunately, he has already passed away. But also, Olga and Picasso, they never really get divorced. Uh, she ends up leaving him in 1935 because Picasso is not a one-woman type of guy. He has numerous affairs. Olga is going to pass away in 1955. And we can see kind of a painting of Olga here at the left in 1920, and we see her again much different in a later 1930s painting. Among the individuals he had an affair with were Marie Therese Walker, who was only 17 at the time when she was posing for this work, Woman in the Mirror. They have a daughter together, Maya, who is still alive, and she's in her 80s. Marie Therese Walker gets tossed aside for the famous surrealist photographer, Dora Maar. And she's going to be also famous because allegedly she has painted parts of Picasso's famous painting, Guernica. We don't know exactly what her contribution was to that artwork, but I'll be showing you that at the end of the presentation. But perhaps the most famous woman that he's involved with is Francois Gelot, who to me is really the person that I think of when I think of Picasso's wife. They have a long relationship that lasts about 10 years, but she continues a, a relationship with him afterwards because she is the person who is at his deathbed in 1973. They do have two children together, Claude, who manages the Picasso estate today, and Paloma, who has her own business. Um, this is also a person who wrote uh, the book Life with Picasso. I want to move back to a few artworks that are significant. This is the very last Cubist painting Picasso does. It's called The Three Musicians, and it is, a, again, a memorial portrait to the person playing clarinet at the left. This is Apollinaire, the poet. We have Picasso in the center, again dressed up as a harlequin, and the individual at the right was also another friend of theirs who was so upset by Apollinaire's death that he joined a monastery. And that's why you see him here dressed up as a monk. This is a painting that Picasso does after the First World War. And it's kind of interesting to see the effect of the World War on art. This is also explained more in a separate lecture, but basically Picasso, the leading abstract artist, the leading avant-garde artist of the day, after the war, for a while, reverts back to painting very classical imagery, very much in the style of Michelangelo. And we also know about this painting, Luncheon on the Grass, by Manet. And Manet was a favorite artist of Picasso's. Picasso said no one could put as much into a painting as Manet could. So he copied luncheon on the grass, not just three times, but how about over 150 times? And this is something that Picasso does throughout his career. We have Las Meninas by Velazquez and Picasso's version. We have the women of Algiers by Jeanne Delacroix and Picasso's take on it. And this work is by Poussin. It's called The Triumph of Pan. 
and Picasso's version. So at this point, I kind of want to show you a little short video of Picasso himself painting. And I do realize that was Picasso drawing, not painting, as I had first stated at the beginning of the video. So I apologize for that, but I hope you found it interesting. I want to end this lecture talking about Guernica, which is probably Picasso's second most famous work, or at least second most important work. And this takes place during the Spanish Civil War of 1936-37 and it was created in response to the bombing of Guernica, which is a Basque village in the northern part of Spain by German and Italian warplanes. This work is in black and white and gray. It's incredibly large. It's the largest work Picasso ever created, 11 feet high, 26 feet wide, and it, the I'm just going to let the painting speak for itself. Now, there are several different states of it that have been photographed. I think there's about seven overall. Again, we don't know how much Dora Maar contributed to the work, but we can see a couple different versions of it here. Again, this is black, white, and gray, and it was commissioned by the government of Spain, and it was placed in their pavilion, the Spanish pavilion, at the World's Fair of that year. But this is the finished work here, and we can see that it's very emotional. We have the woman at the left screaming uh, over her child that is dead that she's holding in her hand. We have even the horse to the right screaming, and above its head is this light but we have that recontextualization of it looking like an explosion. Down below, we also have the very famous image of the fallen soldier, which is something that we see in classical art. And even though Picasso is very much an avant-garde artist, he always references the past, whether it is that still life in La Demoiselle de Avignon, or the poses of the women in that painting, whether it's the fallen soldier here that we see heavily during the classic age, such as during the Greek civilization, or even the, the bull that we see in the upper left-hand corner here. This is something that he even got, and it became a symbol from seeing the bulls painted on the walls of the cave at Lascaux, this primitive art. But anyway, this is a really fantastic painting, and 
this is where I'm going to end our lecture on Picasso.